Hi, we are the Heilmans. I am Zach, and this is my wife, Caitlin, um, and we are part of the 514 Giving family. Um, we started coming to 514 in fall of 2016 uh, when we st when you guys started the uh, We Can't series um, for the second time. Um, we kind of dove pretty far deep in right away. Um, I would say in the past at other churches we've been to, we haven't we weren't very good at continuing to tithe um, regularly. Um, but it was something that we could see that was really passionate um, to us moving forward in our lives. We could tell the church was very passionate about it as well. Um, and ever really since then, we've had a lot of really awesome things started to happen in our life. Um, we bought a house. Um, we started our family with our little daughter, Charlotte. Um, my wife just finished her up her master's degree um, to become an NP. Um, so we've just got a really, a lot of awesome stuff that's happened to us, um, putting our faith in God, um, doing a monthly, weekly um, tithing. has just been awesome for us. We just didn't hesitate to do the automated giving during the We Can't series, and we decided to go all in and trust God with our finances like never before. And I think like right now during a time of this season of uncertainty and unpredictable events, we've just really decided to lean on God, and that's one constant thing in our lives. Like the way God says in John 16, 33, um, there will be trials and triumphs through our lives and sorrows, but to take heart because he's already overcome the world. And I think that that's the constant thing that we have in our lives right now, and that's just something that we're not willing to give up. We just really want to encourage everyone to give and trust God the way that we've trusted God because it's been such a strong impact on our life and can still be impactful during a time like this. Um, with unprecedented times and circumstances for your family. We feel like it's really brought us stronger together as a family, as a couple, as parents. Um, it's grown our spiritual faith tremendously and we just can't stress enough how important it's been for us. Tithing is, is great no matter what it is. Um, trusting God with your finances and sh it'll show fruitfully for you um, in the future. Um, giving is really easy. Um, you can go through the, app, the new 514 app that's um, available to download if you haven't downloaded it yet. Um, that you can do a weekly, monthly, bi-weekly um, setup. It's, it's super easy. You can do all that through the app online. We love you guys so much. We cannot wait to all be back together and be with our 514 family and be in our building. Worship God, but let's all do it now so that it can be even greater when we're back together. Yeah, love you guys, miss you guys. Can't wait to see everyone. Morning, everybody. Welcome. We are so glad that you guys are here with us today. The, the, the video that we just watched of the Heilmans talking about generosity, you know, that, that kind of story is, is really powerful because that is the, the, the godly spirit of generosity that becomes manifest in the church. And that is the call of the church. And, you know, going through a, a journey like that myself, one of the things that I tend to believe is that the only way you could ever become a generous person, that you could really practice and embody generosity in that way, is if it comes from a heart of gratitude. You know, if you're actually thankful and believe in the goodness of, of, of all of the things that, that God has given us. And so, you know, today, in the midst of all of this that we have going on, we want to make sure that our hearts are postured towards God in the correct posture of gratitude, that we understand the blessing that we have to be able to gather together as the church digitally to have access to this kind of technology and these kinds of platforms that have never existed in the history of the world, and that we actually get to be a part of this together when all of this is going on. On, on Easter Sunday, I took lunch to my grandma, who, who's 90 years old, and she has belonged to the same church for over 50 years, and they don't have access to this kind of technology. And so right now, for her, a lot of it feels like she's without her community, unable to gather with her church, unable to worship God, unable to sing songs of worship together. And um, we're lucky, you know, we are blessed to be in this position and to be able to do this, that the whole world has come to a screeching halt. And yet we, as the church, every Sunday are able to gather together and worship God together and be the church and be what we are called to be. And that is a beautiful thing. And so with that being said, you know, we continue to posture ourselves with gratitude in this time. If we lose our gratitude, we lose our joy. And as Christians, the claim is that our joy is unconnected to our circumstances. And so in the midst of all circumstances, we posture our hearts towards God with gratitude because we know that God is good all the time. 
And we feel that on mornings like today. And so with that being said, I am very grateful to have an opportunity to share with the church something that has been on my heart um, over the last few weeks. And like I said, a couple weeks ago was Easter. And on Easter weekend, we celebrate Good Friday, which is the celebration of the crucifixion. And then we celebrate Easter Sunday, which is a celebration of the resurrection of Jesus. And in terms of the way calendars and holidays tend to work, uh, the holiday comes and we recognize it and we emphasize it and we commemorate whatever that holiday is meant to commemorate. And then we kind of move on in our lives. And um, the problem for Christians doing that with Easter is that Easter is not just an event that we have as Christians. Easter is the event that defines our existence. It defines our heart. You know, whatever happened on Easter is not just an amazing thing that we're happy that it happened. It is something that has occurred because of which our lives today are different, that a power has been unleashed into the world that is now affecting us, moving into our hearts and minds and transforming us. And so when we take on the moniker of Christians, when we say we're Christian, we are claiming to be Easter people. We're claiming to be people of the resurrection, which means we're claiming that Easter affects us not just because it happened then, but what happened then affects us now. And so we are Easter people. What does it mean to be Easter people? How do we take that into our lives and move with that uh, when it's not Easter? How are we to define ourselves as Easter people? How does this work? There's a a man whose name is Rowan Williams, and Rowan Williams was the ex- or former Archbishop of Canterbury. And the Archbishop of Canterbury is the head of the Church of England, or the Anglican Church. And so he's the head bishop of the Church of England. And because of his position, there's all of these stories about people coming up to him and asking him, you know, if I want to move into that line of work, if I want to become a bishop, or if I want to move into vocational ministry, or if I want to become involved in the life of the parish, or just if I want to be a Christian and live in this world, how do I do that? What advice do you have for me? And the story goes that of all the people that that asked him this question, his first response was always that if you want to pursue that kind of life, if you want to do that kind of thing in this world, it helps if you believe in God. And that's kind of funny because it's assumed in the question they're asking about becoming a bishop or becoming a, a minister of the gospel, so it seems like belief in God is assumed. But Rowan Williams is not really like a glib or a trite or a sarcastic man, and so I think that he's being genuine when he says that, and I think what he's getting at here is this tension that we all feel sometimes, and that is that to believe in God as a Christian, to confess the Christian faith is not to to have a general belief that there is a God. It's not to believe in the existence of God. You know, James, the brother of Jesus, writes in his letter that, you know, so you believe. Well, even the demons believe. That, that's not the point, to believe that God exists. The point of the Christian confession is not that a God exists or that God exists, but that this God exists and that the implications from this God exist and, and, and matter. And so when you think about it that way, um, you know, what we're claiming is Easter. We're claiming that the God that has been revealed in history, in creation, in the fall, uh, in the nation of Israel, in the holy scriptures, and then ultimately, most clearly, most finally, the God that has been revealed in the person, the, the incarnation, the crucifixion, the resurrection of Jesus, the one we call the Christ, that that is our God, that the creator and sustainer of the universe, the absolute non-contingent being within which everything that you and I have ever consciously experienced is located within, that that God, that power, actually became flesh and blood and walked amongst us. And not only did he walk amongst us, but he subjected himself to sin and evil and death on the cross. And then not only did he die, but then he went into the ground and was buried and then he was raised. And not only did he rise from the dead then, but the Christian claim is that that God is risen today, that that power is reigning today, that the resurrection is And because the resurrection is, the power of the resurrection is today in our lives right now. It's not something that happened that we're thankful for because it happened then. It's something that happened and is affecting us today. That's the Christian claim. That's the center of our faith. It's not more general or broad than that. It's not hazier than that. That is the Christian confession. That is what it means to believe in God as a Christian. And whenever we want to talk about the power of God that has been unleashed in this world, that that we are now affected by, uh, for me, the the place that you you should start is in John chapter 1. And in the Gospel of John, verses 1 through 18, he writes what is called the prologue 
of the Gospel of John. And it's called the prologue because John was an eyewitness disciple of Jesus. And so he writes an account of the death or the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And before he gets into the story of what happened in Jesus' life, he gives what I will call a, a theological or philosophical summary of the Christ event. You know, what does it mean that God became flesh? That, that is a very difficult question to answer. And so one of the things that John does is at the very beginning, he summarizes the event of Jesus Christ. And, and I'm gonna read this, and we're gonna read this together. Um, but I want you guys to notice how John links the creation of the world, the creation of the cosmos, everything that you see, that power and then the life of Jesus Christ. So somehow, according to John, the power of creation is linked to the event of Jesus Christ. And so this is what John says. We're gonna read all of one through 18. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John, and this is John the Baptist. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world, and he was in the world. And the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth." John bore witness about him and cried out, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace on, uh, in place of grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. John chapter one, verses one through 18. And you see John linking the creation of the world to the event of Jesus Christ. What, what John says is that in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And through this word, all things were created. And there's nothing in this creation that was created apart from this word. And then that word became flesh and dwelt in our midst in the person of Jesus. And for John... The word is the creative power of God, right? The, 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 the power that created the cosmos, the word. And the word that we translate into English as word is a Greek word, and it's logos. L-O-G-O-S is the transliteration, logos. And if you think about English vernacular words that we might use that sound like logos, you might think of logic, and that's correct. You know, logic is the idea that things make sense, that there's patterns and there's progressions and there's predictability in the world. And because of that, you can see things and you can actually understand them and even reproduce them. And uh, when you think about natural theology and you look at the creation of the world, if you believe that God created this world, uh, what you're gonna see is that there is a lot of logic. There is a lot that makes sense. There's a lot of patterns. There's a lot of predictability. You know, you think about just scientific things like the earth rotates on its axis at a, at a specific speed, and because of that, we know when it's gonna be light, and we know when it's gonna be dark, and we can predict those things, that we're orbiting around the sun at, at a specific speed and at a specific distance, and so there's seasons, and we can, we can understand how to shelter ourselves, how to clothe ourselves, how to grow food in certain regions because of those seasons, because the world is predictable. You know, we, we can understand that it, it, there's a progression that's logical about the world that we live in. You think about hard sciences and the fact that we can dig down into the atomic and subatomic level of materiality to understand what this world actually exists of, far smaller than our eyes can actually see or, 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 or perceive. And the only reason that's possible is because there's a logic to this world. Uh, this world has a givenness to it. There is a, an order to things. And so if God created all this world and the world has that characteristic, then it makes sense for the creator of the world to be called the Lagos. 
And that is exactly what John is saying here. When you go back to Genesis chapter one and you read the story of God creating the world, you see him doing exactly that. You know, it says in the beginning, um, God created the heavens and the earth and the earth was without form and void and the spirit of God hovered over the face of the deep. And so in the beginning, there's a formless and void world that's covered in water and it's chaos and it's darkness and it's illogical and because it's disordered, life cannot flourish and so you read the rest of Genesis chapter one and what does God do to that chaotic world? Well, he says, let there be light and he separates the light from the darkness and he says that logic is good. He creates day, he creates night, they're separate. That's logic. He separates the dry land from the water, the sky from the place where we stand and exist, and those things are all good. He creates ecosystems, animals uh, on the ground, birds in the sky, fish in the sea, vegetation that produces and reproduces itself, and all of these things are separate from each other, and yet they all work in symbiosis with each other logically. And then he creates humans a little bit higher than the other animals, and he puts us in charge of creation to steward it and to take this good world and make it even better. And all of a sudden, at the end of one chapter, the first page of the Bible, a chaotic and dark world that cannot sustain life has been organized into a logical, patterned, predictable, ordered world where life can now flourish. That's the logos, the creative power of God. And what John is saying is that that logos, that creative power of God that breathed this beautiful world into existence, that power became flesh and blood and walked amongst us in the person of Jesus Christ. And so it's the creative power of God that was an itinerant uh, rabbi from Galilee. It's the creative power of God that got put up on a cross and died at the hands of sin and evil and death. It's the Lagos creative power of God then that rose from the dead and that we claim is risen today, which means that the creative power of God somehow in the resurrection has been unleashed into the world in a powerful, efficacious way that we are being changed by it, that we're being formed by it. And so, so, so how does that work? How are we now on this side of the cross affected by the resurrection that we claim is and that the Lagos power of God that has been unleashed into the world. And one of the people who was particularly interested in explaining this was the Apostle Paul. Because first and foremost, Paul was a missionary and a church planter. He was an apostle of the early church. And he planted these churches and what he was really interested in people understanding is what exactly has happened in the Christ event. You know, like, what now does that mean for us? You know, Paul is very practical. He's with people. They're trying to be the church. And he wants them to understand what has occurred in the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And so there are certain themes that he emphasizes and that he repeats. And one of the things that he talks a lot about is salvation by faith versus salvation by works. And the reason he talks a lot about that, I mean, is because it's very complicated and, and there's lots of reasons. One of them is because God revealed himself to the Jewish people through the law. And when Jesus came, the law was fulfilled. A new revelation has occurred. A new covenant is here. And so there's something new for us to follow. And there's a new way that we're being affected by God. But the other reason he focuses so much on, on faith versus works is because if you can save yourself... If you can make yourself righteous, then it is not the power of God that saves. So if you can ascend to righteousness with God by your own merit, by your own goodness, by your own holiness, by your own effort, then you are effectively denying the power of God in this world. And um, Paul is not going to allow the churches that he plants to ever believe that their salvation is not only affected by the power of God, that God has actually done something to change us and to transform us and to save us. And in Romans chapter four, he gets into this and he starts to talk to the church in Rome about this very idea. And he goes all the way back to, to Abraham, the father of the faith, and he says, even Abraham was saved not by his own works, but by faith. God reached into Abraham's life and saved Abraham. And this is what he says. He says, what then shall we say was gained by Abraham? our forefather according to the flesh. For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? It says Abraham believed, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now, 
To the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one whom God counts righteousness apart from works, and this is a psalm, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whom the Lord will not count his sin. And so you see Paul here using language that is unapologetically emphasizing that God is the active agent in our salvation. Our righteousness is because of something that God is doing, not because of our merit, not because of our actions, not because of our goodness, but because God has reached into our lives and changed us. And the word that Paul uses here that we translate into English is counted. We're righteous because we've been counted righteous. You know, we're righteous because, as the King James Version says, we've been reckoned righteous. Something has happened to us rather than us doing it ourselves. And that word that's translated as counted or reckoned in the original Greek is a verb, and the verb is logizomai. Logizomai. This should be on the screen. And what does that word remind you of? What does, it, what does that word make you remember about what we've already talked about today? You remember the logos? You remember the creative power of God that breathed this world into existence, the word of God that, that, that became flesh and blood and walked amongst us? Well, according to Paul, in the resurrection, that word, that logos power has been unleashed into the world and we now are being logizomied. We now, by the logos, are being affected and changed. We, just like Abraham, are not uh, responsible for our salvation because of our works. We are not new creation because we fashioned ourselves into new creation. The creative power of God, the logos of God, has invaded our hearts and our souls and our minds, and we now are being logizomide. We are being changed. We are being transformed. We are actually being affected by the same power that spoke this world into existence. We're being counted righteous. We are being worded into the light of the resurrection. That's the word of God, according to Paul. That's the link between what happened in the beginning, what happened in Jesus, and what happens in the church, that the logos power of God is logizomizing those who have faith in him. The power that breathed this world into existence is now in our lives, changing us, breathing us into new existence. Now, you have to understand that we, we do tend to understand the power of words. That's the word of God. Joel did a series a, a couple years ago now, probably, and his bottom line was, uh, words create worlds. And you think about just like that from, a, from like a negative standpoint and how true that is. You know, words like shame, rejected, unworthy. You know, a lot of us, we fashion our whole lives around running away from those words, around healing from the trauma of those words or coping with the trauma of those words. But this word, the word, the logos, this word of God is not spoken against us, it is spoken for us. And God's word is performative, which means it creates what it names. And so we are named righteous, we are counted righteous, which means that that same power that breathed this world into existence has invaded our lives and is changing us into something new today, the same world-creating way that God breathed this world into existence, he is breathing us into new life. He is breathing us into resurrection life. We are being logizomide, and that's the story of the scriptures. That's the story of Jesus. That's the story of the church. That's the God that Rowan Williams is suggesting that we believe in. The voice of the Son of God has the ability to call death into existence where there's life, obedience, where there's disobedience, belief, where there's doubt, and this power of God to call into existence things that do not exist is one of the defining characteristics of the resurrection, death where there's life. And so if the resurrection is, if that is our reality, then the creative power of God is in our lives affecting us right now. But the power of God is not only present in our lives, but it's active in our lives. If the resurrection is, then the logos, world-creating power of God, has invaded your day-to-day -day life and is at work in you right now, today. And that's why we're Easter people. That's what it means to be a Christian, if the resurrection is. There's a, uh, a Methodist preacher named Will Williman, 
And he says that the problem with unbelievers and skeptics and cultural casual Christians, or maybe even just Christians like myself who sometimes lack a certain level of, of depth of faith, the problem is simple. The problem is that we think Jesus is dead. And so the question for us two weeks after Easter that we ought to ponder is this, is Jesus dead? Or is Jesus the living Lord of the cosmos, intimately close to each one of us that he calls and loves? Because if Jesus is dead, then all of the confessions of Christianity are meaningless. The resurrection is not, then everything we say on Sundays, and all of the ethics that we've built the Western world on, none of it actually means anything. They might be useful, but they're not true. If the resurrection is not, then as the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, we are to be the most pitied people on earth. But if the resurrection is, if Jesus is alive, and we are in Christ bound to his death and his resurrection through faith, then we have more than hope. We have more than happiness, and we have far more than circumstances. We have power. We have his power. We have the Lagos power in our lives, with us, present with us today, and according to the scriptures, the resurrection is. Christ is risen, which means that the creative power of God is creating and recreating daily in your own life, and all of the small, seemingly mundane things that you do, and the consequence of the resurrection being our reality is that you are never alone. You're not alone. You're never alone. You might feel alone. You might be isolated right now. You know, you might uh, be ready to str- strangle your beautiful image of God, children, or heaven forbid, your beautiful image of God's spouse or roommate. You may feel insecure, you may have lost your job, you may have had your, your finances cut, your future may feel like, like it's up in the air and nothing is quite going the way that we wished that it was going, but if the resurrection is, then we are not alone. We don't wake up and face those kinds of trials and face those kinds of tribulations and face those kinds of fires by ourselves. We face that day and those circumstances with the creative power and presence of God. You know, I see these, uh, these Instagram videos of people trying to educate their children at home, but like you're their parent, you're not their teacher, so like they don't wanna listen to you. Shout out to my sister Carrie. And um, that seems very frustrating. And yet, something as seemingly mundane as that, the scriptures teach us that because the resurrection is, you're not doing that alone. You're not trying to wrangle your children who are stir crazy and make them listen to you by yourself. You are doing that with the same power that created the world, with the Lagos power of God. And so you're not alone. You're not alone. You are never, ever, ever alone. And when you see this in action, when you see somebody who believes that the resurrection is, um, it will change you forever. I told you on Easter Sunday I went to, to see my grandma and I took her lunch, and uh, you know, she is isolated right now, and she's at risk, and so she, uh, she can't see her, her family or her friends, and she's lonely, and in November uh, last year, she, she lost her, her husband, my grandfather, who was her husband of over 60 years, and 10 years prior to his death, he suffered from really severe dementia, and so her whole life, was based around caring for him and seeing him and being a part of what he was doing. And so when he passed away, you know, so much of who she was seemed to pass away, you know, with him. And there, there's giant, you know, vacuum in her life. And now here she is a couple months later and she's isolated, not even allowed to be around her family and her children. So I take her lunch and she's telling me this and I'm like getting emotional because I, you know, I love this woman so much. And uh, she starts to tell me about how much the church means to her and how sad she is that she can't see her people. And then she starts to tell me how proud she is of me for giving my life to the local church. And she says that there is nothing more valuable or important that you could possibly give your life to. She said it is the thing that keeps her alive today. And so I'm like getting like, like misty because there's lots of emotions going around. You know, uh, 
I come from a world with the people that I'm close to, man, it's, not a, uh, it's a very unchurched world. So they see what I'm doing. They see w- what I'm doing here. And, you know, they, they might think it's like weird or, or, you know, strange or maybe even interesting, but not like noble. And so for the woman, who was one of the most important women in my life, to, to say that to me, and also to be feeling her loneliness and her isolation. You know, I've got all kinds of emotions happening right now and I don't emote very well. And so she sees that I'm becoming kind of flustered and she says, uh, thank you for lunch, happy Easter, John. And I said, happy Easter, Grandma. And she put her hands in the air and she said, he is risen. And I said, he is risen. And then she smiled, the the smile that I've seen for for 31 years. And she said, hallelujah. And I said, hallelujah. And I went to my car and cried like a baby because she gets it. You know, all that theology we just talked about, all that Bible that we just talked about, the word that created the world becoming flesh, that power, that same power being unleashed into the church through faith, to create and recreate in our lives daily, the fact that we're never alone, she gets that, she feels that, she has lived that. You know, I feel like that escapes me most of the time, that I can't quite feel it the way that I wish I could. I can't quite be connected to that the way that I could, but she gets it. And you know, she has lived a life, she's 90 years old. Um, She's loved and she's lost faithful wife of over 60 years to the only man that she ever loved, mother of three children, including my mom, school teacher. She struggled with anxiety and depression before it was okay to struggle with anxiety and depression. She found immense joy and took great care of her her grandchildren, like myself and my siblings and her great-grandchildren, like my nieces and nephews. She, She watched the man that she loved you know, transform into somebody else through, through this illness. And then she said goodbye to him from this world. And then she picked herself back up and was ready to, to, to move on and the rest of her life. And now she's trapped inside due to a, a global once in a lifetime pandemic. And her response to all of this joy and all of this pain, to all of this beauty and all of this struggle her response to living for 90 years with the tension that we all feel that this, this life, this world is devastatingly beautiful and yet it is not as it should be and so we long for something more. Her response to 90 years of that, all of that, is to look at her 31-year-old grandson on Easter Sunday and to put her hands in the air and say, he is risen, hallelujah. And... Um, I'll never forget that moment because I saw Easter on Easter. Uh, You know, I looked into the eyes of somebody that the Apostle Paul writes later in Romans who is more than a conqueror, someone who's more than a conqueror. And, you know, that, that that will never leave me. That will never leave me. She believes that the resurrection is. She believes that he is risen that the power of God that creates and recreates is present in her life and that is an unshakable, unflappable conviction that 90 years of ups and downs can never take away from her. As Rowan Williams would say, she believes in God. As Will Williman would say, she believes Jesus is alive. She's an Easter person. And so, Today, in the midst of what we're all going through right now, you know, may we all move into our lives like my grandmother, knowing that, the, that, the, that God is not only real, but that he's powerful. And not only is that power real, but it's present. And not only is it present, but it is active in your life. It is creating you, it is recreating you. It can never leave you. And because the resurrection is, uh, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. He is risen, hallelujah. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for your revelation in this world. Thank you for being a God who moves in history, who moves in our lives, who comes down and invades 
this world and makes it something new and makes it something great and recreates it all the time, God. Thank you for giving us something like Easter to celebrate, but thank you for giving us something like Easter to define who we are and to define our faiths. Please, God, give the people of this life, like my grandma, who embody resurrection power, give them the opportunities and the platforms to continue to speak wisdom and to speak life into the younger generation, like myself, and into the younger church, so that every single time we, we gather together on Sunday, we remember that we're resurrection people, we remember that we're Easter people, we remember that the resurrection is, that, that, that the, the Spirit of God that breathed this world into existence is breathing us into new life and recreating us every single day. Thank you for who you are, and thank you for giving us this community to worship together, God. It's in your name we pray, amen. How great the chasm that lay between us How high the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name into the night then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken. I am forgiven, the King of kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living Lord. Hallelujah.
right, guys. Thank you guys for joining us today. You know, as we as we disperse back into the world, you know, we are now in like week six or seven or something of this. And so there are people who are being really, really affected right now, uh, people of our community. And there is uh, some people who are in the midst of tragedy right now. And we know about some of it, but there's some that we don't know about. And I know that we have some prayer warriors at this church. And so uh, take some time this week to just generically pray for all of the hardships that people may be going through in this community right now. Uh, thank you guys for, for being here with us. Uh, go into the world as you're allowed, regulated by the government right now, and be the light. And we will see you tomorrow, 5 o'clock for Live at 5. We love you guys. Happy Sunday.